All right, everybody. I'm really excited to uh, uh, to be back in 2022 um, after a brief hiatus around the, the holidays and uh, equally excited to be introducing our own Sergei Avchinikov, who's going to give us another awesome ML tutorial today. Uh, so Sergei, please take it away. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, I guess what I'm deciding to call co-op design, but I'm not sure if that's the name I'll go with, but I guess that'll, that'll stick for now. Um, so, so the idea is that there's been a lot of tools that people have been developing uh, towards um, uh, making different models accessible for protein design. Um, and what I've been trying to do is make them all accessible through Google Colab. So this includes TR Rosetta, and now more recently uh, AlphaFold and seeing if we can use that for design. Um, yeah, so, so the things I'll, I'll walk through today is uh, I'll describe TR Rosetta. This is just a recap from last time because I think there might be some people here that maybe haven't seen me spoke, speak before. Uh, I'll describe how we use TR Rosetta to do protein design. The idea here is that we're just inverting the model. Um, and then I'll go through some issues that we found with TR Rosetta and how we went about to try to fix these problems. Um, and I will conclude that that section with some experimental results. Um, this is in collaboration with Gabe Rockland, we finally got a chance to actually test some of these methods to see if there's actually anything useful that's coming out or if it's just computers just saying garbage. Um, and, and then uh, for the second part, I'll move on to describing some of the new modern methods. These are Rosetta Fold and Alpha Fold. Um, and then Ji Wang will, will come in for a bit and describe some of the exciting work we've been doing together on partial hallucination. Um, I've asked you to actually come back maybe a couple months from now once all the code is public to potentially give like a more formal tutorial. So he would just give a few introductory slides, but then later on, maybe a few months from now, we'll have him stop by and, and give a, a, a really cool tutorial. Um, and then finally, towards the end, um, I will describe some of the code I've been developing to try uh, to allow people to design uh, proteins with alpha fold. Okay, so, so that's that's the outline I'll follow, just to keep things sane. Um, okay, so we know with methods like TR Rosetta, um, that you can take a multiple sequence alignment, uh, a bunch of sequences that are related to each other. So like the first sequence is the sequence you care about. Um, you, can, you can average those sequences and construct a multiple uh, PSSM. You can compute a covariance matrix, invert it, and try to estimate a POTS model or mark a random field. You feed all that information into a method like TR Rosetta to output um, some distances, dihedrals, and so on, and then use that to fold up the protein. Um, and so this is the method how, overall how the method works. Um, but one thing that was kind of interesting, and this is something um, Ivan Nishinka noticed, was that if you actually take uh, de novo design proteins, which actually by definition only have a single sequence, and you feed it to uh, a method like TR Rosetta, it actually does a really good job at predicting the structure. So even when you don't have a multiple sequence alignment, you just literally just feed in a single sequence, and the only features are just the sequence, and then the, for the conservation, you literally just feed the one hot encoded sequence, it actually does a pretty good job. And we saw that you could see the structures actually overlay really nicely. Um, and so this uh, got the idea of saying, well, maybe if uh, methods like TRs that are really, really good at predicting structures, could we just do the same thing over and over and over and actually use one of these models as effectively an Oracle saying like, maybe we have a desired structure. Can we just keep changing the sequence until we get our desired structure? Um, so the idea, and, and one thing that's actually kind of interesting was it turned out that the method itself was not really good for natural proteins. Like if you actually just give a single sequence to methods like TR Rosetta, and more recently, the same observation has been made for Rosetta Fold and Alpha Fold, um, they do not really work really well with a single sequence. But for de novo design proteins, it uh, works really, really well. So the x-axis is TM score uh, and the distribution of de novo design proteins. And so more than 0. 0.5 means you've pretty much got the right fold. Um, and so, so this came, so the idea from that came was, well, if, if that works really well for de novo design proteins, maybe we can take this a step further and just actually design proteins. Um, so the idea would be like, let's say this is your structure that you want. You can compute a distance matrix from that. Um, you can start with some random sequence, pass it to these model like TR Rosetta, get a predicted distance matrix, take the difference between those and then use the difference as the loss pass it through the model and tell you how to update your input sequence. And you might wonder like, why would we want to actually do this? Like, why not just design a method that goes from structure to sequence? Like, why do we want to take a method that goes from uh, sequence to structure, um, sorry, go, go from sequence to structure and try to do the opposite? 
Uh, and so the, the hypothesis here is that we're actually doing something quite different because we're able to see the entire conformation landscape. And so what I mean by that, this uh, is really nicely illustrated in the slide here by Chris and Basil, is that you can think of the traditional methods that take a structure and predict the sequence, like method like Rosetta, um, they have this ability to sort of see that one structure. This is like the structure that you want to get to, and you try to minimize the energy. And one of the problems, if you only look at that one particular structure the whole time, you, that sequence may actually fold into a completely different structure. So you don't really actually see the entire conformation landscape. Alternatively, if you take a structure prediction model that effectively, or at least we claim, can see the entire conformation landscape. And so the idea is like, if you could see the entire conformation landscape, and then if you push to get to the target, then hopefully it won't actually fold into other structures. Um, so, so technically it works and we wrote a paper on it and uh, we tried to do some forward folding and everything looks great. Uh, but since then we sort of went back and started to look at it more carefully, try to see, are there any holes in this model? Is there any things that we could do to improve these models? Um, and so one simple experiment is to say, well, let's take a whole bunch of proteins from the PDB, something that was not in the training set, um, remove the sequence from that protein. So now you have a much just the backbone and then use this design trust strategy that I just described to you a little bit earlier to design a bunch of sequences. So design a new sequence for this protein. Uh, and then what you could do is you can compare the design protein, sorry, the, the, the original protein to the design protein and see how many of the side chains are recapitulated. So what fraction of these amino acids match these amino acids? So that's our sequence recovery. And if we do that, um, and we compare sort of our traditional method Rosetta to this new method that we developed TR design, or I guess I call it TR Rosetta here, um, the sequence recovery looked very low. Um, so with Rosetta, what you see is if you, if you do the same, same exact procedure with Rosetta um, and compare these two sequences, um, there you get about 35, 40%, depending on the protocol that you use. Um, but with TR Rosetta, it looked like on average, we're about 15%. I mean, 15% is not terrible because roughly 15% is where PFAM is defined. So if these two proteins, two sequences are within about 15% identity, uh, often they're part of the same protein family. So that wasn't completely terrible, like it wasn't zero, but still being 15 was a little bit scary, like what's actually going on. Um, and so some of the hypothesis that we had was, well, maybe there's some kind of, these sequences are adversarial. Um, maybe the model is just very low resolution. And so it really can't, like if, if it only sees things that say at two angstroms, um, then maybe the reason why you can't get those side chains exact uh, identical is because the, the structure is quite different from what it's trying to design for. Um, and then the other thing is maybe the model only sees a subset of the, se uh, the sequence like when making the prediction. And finally, maybe we're modeling this probability of structure given the sequence, but the model was pretty much told that every single sequence is perfect. And so if you don't actually model the probability of sequence, maybe you're missing something in the equation. I mean, we tried to account for this by introducing an amino acid composition, but maybe this term needs to be a little bit more extensive than what we're using. Um, and so the first hypothesis is, is it adversarial sequences? And the reason why this is kind of important is because in the literature, when people try to invert classification models before, they've seen that you can actually come up with some really crazy looking pictures uh, and still get the same classification. Uh, so for, in this particular example is a, a CNN model looks at this and predicts it, I'm guessing a house or I don't know. But so if you invert the model and then try to hallucinate more things that have the same classification, these are the images that you get. And so one, one idea is like, well, maybe the sequences are one really noisy or maybe um, it just doesn't make, that's why the sequence recovery is so low. We kind of discounted that hypothesis right away because one thing we did in the paper is we looked at uh, how, like if you just design a whole bunch of proteins and look at them, they appear to follow the statistics of which amino acids are found close to each other. So for example, uh, residues inside the protein um, that are in contact with each other tend to be hydrophobic. Um, and, and so the idea is like, you actually see a lot of these statistics recapitulated in, in these design proteins. So, so these pairwise statistics are recapitulated. Uh, the amino acid propensities are recapitulated. Well, like for example, different amino acids are found in helices versus sheets. So those probabilities are recapitulated. And finally, the hydrophobicity is recapitulated even to a point where it, it's appeared that it was even doing a better job than Rosetta at recapitulating the statistic. So that, so that told us, okay, these sequences aren't completely garbage, uh, that there is some actually uh, uh, an 
it, there is some kind of interesting um, connection there. So these, so, so the next hypothesis is like, well, maybe the model is just low resolution. Um, and so this hypothesis comes from this paper here, or at least this is where I've seen uh, examples about it described before. So the idea is if you take a structure and you just jitter it, like move it around. And so this protocol is referred to as a back rub. Uh, so if you wiggle the backbone a bit, and then you take that backbone and you pass it to a method like uh, Rosetta and ask it to design into protein, um, what we find is that as you start to move this backbone around, the sequence recovery starts to drop. So if your temperature is 1.8, you're now around maybe 15% sequence recovery. But these numbers were, didn't make a lot of too much sense to me, so I wasn't. So I actually repeated this experiment, uh, and for the exact same data set that I described before. So what I did was I took uh, all those proteins and um, try to j use the same protocol back rub, but now looking at RMSD. And what we found was that as, as soon as you start to move the backbone of about two angstrom RMSD, then um, sequence recovery actually drops to um, to be pretty low. And, and so the reason why this is kind of significant is if you go back a few slides that I showed you guys, um, this slide right here, we could see that the Denoa designed proteins, um, their, their TM score, their accuracy of their structure is like somewhere around maybe 0 0.8, maybe 0 0.7. Uh, and so if the model is only able to predict structures at the accuracy of about 0.7 uh, TM score, then we would actually expect to get um, sequence recovery in this range, 15% to 20% range. So it was totally in line with that. So, so the, the observation is totally in line with that. So like maybe if, if TR Rosetta only is dealing at a resolution of two inks from RSD, and that's probably why we're having such hard time predicting those structures, uh, sorry, designing structures to have really high sequence recovery. Um, another hypothesis is that, well, maybe like when this model, like if you if we go back a little bit to this little toy doddle example that I showed, uh, sorry, let's go back a little bit further. So one possibility is that maybe when methods like TR Rosetta looking at the sequence may not actually be looking at the entire sequence. Like you could, one thing you could imagine is maybe there are a few key residues that determine this fold. And so as soon as this model sees the few key residues, it'll say, oh, okay, this is the structure. And then it does no uh, incentive to actually um, look at the rest of the protein. And so if you use these methods to design, you'll see the exact same problem where maybe you put a few key residues for that determine the fold. And after that, there might not actually be any incentive to, to push this model any further. But so, so to test this hypothesis, what we did was we said, okay, let's just take one random protein and design a whole bunch of sequence fit for us. And instead of designing a single sequence, let me just design, I don't know, 10,000 sequences. And then I could take these 10,000 sequences and, and run them through a co-evolution co algorithm, such as Gremlin, um, and ask the question, okay, which residue pairs are covariating with each other? And when we did that, we saw something kind of interesting, and that is that not all the residues that were in contact in the crystal structure were actually in contact, uh, or at least covariating in, in the structure in the sequences that we had designed. Um, and so this sort of uh, uh, supported this idea that maybe the model saw like a few key residues that maybe determine uh, uh, like a sheet, sheet pairing and a helix helix pairing, but then everything else is sort of determined by some other aspects of the model. Um, in fact, if you sort of look at this model a little bit more carefully, so right now I've been showing you this neural network as just this little uh, uh, cartoon here, but if we actually look at this network a little more carefully, and it turns out it's, it's actually made up a bunch of residual blocks. Um, and I won't go into too much details, but the main thing is that you have a bunch of blocks that just pass information from one block to the next box, the next block, um, and sort of transform it along the way. Um, and in fact, so what's happening is you got these information, uh, they get concatenated, stacked into this 2D plot, and all this gets passed to the end to make the prediction. Um, and, but just to make our lives easier, I'm just gonna look at one example. So this is just, let's say the contact map. Um, and so one interesting thing is if you just look at all the layers, you see all the contacts that are predicted by the model. So given the sequence predicts the contact, but if you start to remove these blocks one by one, you start to see less and less contacts. And so one thing that we saw that was kind of interesting was that at block seven, you saw a lot of uh, the same contacts, and let me just skip a little bit for it, that were observed in their correlation matrix. So what this sort of told us is that maybe what's happening is that the model sees the sequence, makes some uh, contact predictions based on that, and then maybe what's happening is at some point, these blocks are effectively just playing connect the dot. 
Uh, so even if you sort of optimize a, a few of the subset of the contacts, uh, you could just play connect the dot and eventually fill in all the contacts. Um, and so, so this of course is problematic because let's say if your model is effectively doing error correction to your sequence, then there's no reason like during design, the sequence will become like the best possible sequence it can be um, if it's being corrected effectively, maybe from blocks nine through 12. Um, and, and so, so this is where we're like, okay, well maybe, so, so it's possibility. So, so we don't really have an answer which of the hypothesis is true um, or, or more likely, but it seems like maybe all of these things are somewhat at play here. Um, and so the question is, can we somehow fix this? Uh, and so this is some new research that I, I haven't described before, is that what we could do is we could say, well, we have a model that goes from sequences to structure. What if we actually train the opposite model? So the idea is like you have a structure, um, you can decompose it into 60 features, which is like the distances, the dihedral's uh, uh, angles, um, and then you ask the model to return to you the conservation and the coevolution matrix. So you can think of these as a Markov random field or a POTS model. Uh, and then you also have all the sequences associated with, associated with the structure. So what you could do is you could say, okay, I'm gonna make sure that all the sequences associated with the structure actually by this model um, are, are actually a uh, high probability. Uh, so in fact, it's almost like saying, let's, let's just train a model that returns a gremlin matrix for a given structure. Um, and so, so the model is relatively straightforward um, and so the idea, uh, and okay, this is what it kind of looks like. You get the collusion, the conservation coming out of the model for a given example. Um, and so now that the idea would be like, well, instead of just optimizing this, this really simple model that I described to you earlier, we could make it a little bit more complex. So, well, let's say we have a structure um, and then we could pass it to this new model that predicts the conservation, the collusion matrix. I mean, another way to think about it is sort of a site-wise, uh, uh, site-wise uh, potential and then pairwise potential. Um, and so, they do, so, so the reason why we think this is kind of interesting is because let's say if the model is having this problem where it's not optimizing for all these contacts, maybe the second model could help fill in these contacts. Like for example, you need to make sure uh, these, all these uh, pairs of residues are, are highly favorable for each other, uh, where the idea would be that maybe TR Rosetta is really good at telling you the full determining uh, constraints but you need a secondary model that tells you the probability of, um, let's say, uh, probability of sequence given structure. Uh, okay, so, so that's the idea. Is like we, we we're going to try to link these things together, and then and then actually combine and have this joint optimization procedure. Um, and so what we found is if we do that, this is showing the old slide, the old results. Uh, sequence recovery is really low, and when we do that, what we found is that the sequence recovery uh, became much better. So now we're combining these two, two models and we could actually get sequence recovery that is better than uh, TR Rosetta. Um, I guess I should have probably included a slide where I'm comparing it back to Rosetta, but right now just comparing it to the old method and we see the sequence recovery improves significantly. Um, but of course, this is just like, we rewrote some code and it made it better. The question is, is it actually better? Um, and so to test this um, in collaboration with uh, Turo and, and Gabriel, um, we, we decided to uh, set up an experiment. And so the idea is like, can we just hallucinate a bunch of proteins with TR Rosetta, uh, similar to that paper from Ivan Nishinka? Uh, and then we could take all those proteins that were hallucinated, we can redesign them with the method that's just using the TRMRF part, it takes the structure, predicts the conservation coevolution. And then we could try to do some kind of joint objective that tries to optimize both of them. Um, and once we did that, what we could do is we can now take these proteins and um, interrogate them experimentally. And so one assay developed by Gabe and Kuturo is to take these proteins and subject them to a protease uh, resistance assay. Uh, and so the idea is like, if the proteins get cleaved up, they're probably less stable. And if they don't, they're uh, more stable. Um, but this is just a proxy for stability. It doesn't necessarily mean stability exactly, but, but we're hoping that maybe we get some signal from that. Um, okay, so just to summarize the whole idea, is we're gonna hallucinate protein with this protocol um, where the idea is like we're trying to, uh, to, so in this case, we're not actually trying to maximize uh, the probabilities to match a given structure. We're saying, hey, just, just try to make the, the, the predictions as sharp as possible, just doing the hallucination text. So we're just gonna make a whole bunch of new proteins. Um, and so, so this is the overall protocol. So it looks a little bit 
busy, but uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna hallucinate proteins and uh, predict the structures uh, and then take these structures and then subject them to this new model TRMRF that I described to you before, uh, just a little bit earlier. Uh, and then we're gonna try to continue hallucination, but now with this ob joint objective. Um, and I, I guess before this gets a little too confusing, let me just uh, describe what I mean here. So the idea here for this model here is we're trying to uh, maximize the probability of structure given sequence. Um, and then this model right here is maximizing the probability of sequence um, given structure. Um, and this one right here is, is maximizing the, the effectively the joint probability. So maximizing both these guys together. Um, and, and so the question is, does it help to combine those two probabilities? So here are the results. Um, so, um, so, so these are so there's two different um, proteases that were uh, measured by Carto, and so one of them is the trypsin one, and one is the chymotrypsin, um, and the x-axis is resistance to the these two guys, and where the black line is sitting is roughly where um, we would say okay, things on the right side is considered stable, things on the left side are considered less stable. Um, and so one thing that we saw, and the results appeared a little too good, was when we had the joint model, um, things were actually much more stable. Um, so that you can see the blue line is effectively almost all across this black line, while the, the previous method, one or the other, uh, had almost like a 50-50 split being stable or unstable. Um, and when we, when we first saw this, we, we kind of got a little concerned because it just looked a little too good because usually nothing in science is supposed to work, um, at least not uh, initially. Um, and so one thing, uh, Hustis, um, who works with us, uh, started looking at some of these proteins. And one thing we noticed is if you pass some of these super, super stable ones to alpha fold, alpha fold would actually predict them as homo ligamers. Uh, so we were starting to maybe concern ourselves saying, well, maybe somehow this joint protocol is biased towards homo ligamers. Um, and, but when we start looking at more carefully, so what, what here, what, what I'm showing here on the x-axis is um, you can think of it as a alpha folds prediction if it's a monomer or a ligamer. And on the y-axis is the resistance that do different uh, protease, uh, proteases. Um, and so what we see from these plots, all I really want you to show here is that there doesn't seem to be a correlation between, is it a monomer versus a stable versus unstable? There are definitely a lot of proteins that are predicted as a ligamer, but if we just sort of cut here and just ignore everything on this side and focus on this side, um, there, there still is more density in the monomerics uh, that is stable versus unstable. So, so after doing some filtering, so what we did was we filtered for PAEs. So this is, uh, uh, the predicted alignment error coming from AlphaFold, which tells you whether or not uh, there is any support for contacts between the two copies of the same protein. Um, and also for highly confident structures. So even after filtering, we still see uh, that the, the, uh, the observation still holds um, that the proteins are indeed more stable when you uh, optimize for this joint function. Um, but one other interesting thing about this, these two slides, or this slide here, is that all of these proteins that you see here, uh, unstable or stable, unstable or unstable, they've all passed through the alpha fold metric. So alpha fold predicts them as monomers, and alpha fold predicts them as to be supposedly really, really good. But you could see that if you just ignore the colors for now, you can see that alpha fold actually, so like one assumption would be like, say if alpha fold is a really good predictor of, of designed proteins that everything should just go become very stable, right? Like everything should just shift to the side. But the fact that it didn't all shift and you still have things on both sides of this distribution tells you that maybe alpha fold is actually not that great of a, um, you, you can't really use it as a way to, to screen for stability. Um, but also alpha fold, like I'll, I'll tell you guys in a little bit, we think it's, it's, I mean, it's effectively the same thing where you're optimizing the probability of sequence, uh, sorry, optimizing the probability of structure given sequence but, there, but the sequence itself, you're not accounting for that probability yet. Um, this is just showing the same data, but uh, because we have one-to-one -one comparison between the structures, we could actually compare the, the trypsin and chymotrypsin stability. So this is comparing TR Rosetta versus TR Rosetta plus, the, plus TR MRF. Um, and you can see things are almost always above the line. Um, I mean, the results still look a little too good. So I'm, I'm kind of worried that maybe there's something else going on here. 
um, that making it look too good. But I guess for now, we'll, we'll just believe that a joint probability is really important. Uh, okay, so, so, so to summarize this whole section, I guess what I could say is that, um, so the, the advantage of inverting a, a model is that it could see the entire landscape, um, but it turns out combining it, it actually leads to more uh, stable proteins. So here I try to sort of summarize why I think this is kind of important. So we can think of probability of structure given sequence as sort of being the uh, equivalent of running uh, ab initio. So this is Rosetta ab initio, where you sort of do a whole forward folding simulation, um, it, which is equivalent to running TR Rosetta, which is equivalent to running alpha fold or Rosetta fold. Um, and, but the assumption here is the sequence you provided is correct. Like there's nothing wrong with the sequence. Um, and now mo models like Rosetta or TRMRF is maximizing the other probability. And here the, prob uh, the assumption is the structure is, is perfect. Um, and so, I mean, but we know that for example, these two variables are, there's a, there's a joint distribution that, that models them. So they, they, they the idea is like the, the sequence can fold into multiple structures or the structure may actually be different if you change the sequence. And so in reality, what we really wanna do is uh, model the joint probabilities. Uh, and so the idea here is that, well, at least what, what I'm claiming here is that maybe by combining these two functions, we are approximating this joint probability. And that maybe in the future, whatever methods we develop for protein design, um, we have to be a little careful to make sure that we optimize for both probabilities. Um, okay, so I think, uh, so I, I guess before I move on to now alpha fold and all that kind of stuff, does anybody have any questions, concerns, or thoughts they would like to share? Quick question, Sergey. Yeah. Um, great work. So I, when um, the Proteus assay was breaking down all the different qualities that led to stability, what qualities were more indicative of the stability for your new designs compared, or the, the designs that combined out all the features than the designs that had like just the TRMF or something? It's uh, a good question. So in this case, it's it's a one-to-one -one comparison. So what we did was, um, uh, so, so the idea is that we, the designs themselves didn't change like as far as the, the backbone is concerned. So, so what's happening is we're hallucinating some protein and then we're pretty much keeping the uh, protein fixed and then we're, we're effectively redesigning the sequence. Um, and so, I mean, as far as like, are there any differences in terms of designs or, or the, like say folds or anything? Uh, we would say probably not. I was more sequence um, question. Um, like oh, yeah. the okay. sequence got more hydrophobic uh, would be ah, my- that, that's, that's a good question. Um, um, I think we were initially worried that maybe got more hydrophobic uh, because we, when we started looking at like the, the most stable ones, it turned out that they were mostly, pre they had a lot of hydrophobics on the surface. Um, but so that's why we went through that whole alpha fold filtering step. Um, but I mean, there might all be other things interesting about those sequences that we may need to also filter for. Um, so, but yeah, sorry, TJ, I guess to answer your question, um, after doing those filterings, we didn't see anything completely weird about them yet, but we, we still investigating the sequences. Cool. Um, I think there was a raised hand here. Oh, um, yes, I just butt in. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> I'm curious if you're basically designing thermophilicity and if it follows the patterns mother nature does, if you compare the same fold from say, psychrophiles, mesophiles, thermophiles. Oh, that, and that's a good point. So it's, possible. So uh, so if we go back to how this TRMRF model is trained, um, it, we're effectively grabbing a whole bunch of sequences uh, uh, that nature has made for this particular structure and, and trained a model to uh, effectively recapitulate all those sequences. Um, so it's possible that it's learned like the most common patterns across, like, so given the structure, what is the most important pairs of residues oh, that you want to optimize? Like comes in. Those are natural sequences that fit that structure? Well, so, so for the training, uh, we trained the model uh, for a given structure. We said, okay, what is what are the most important constraints for the structure? So these being the pairwise constraints and the site-wise constraints. Um, okay. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because at least to give support to your thought is that maybe what's happening is that if you sort of distill the most conserved residues for a given protein structure, and maybe the most conserved pairs of residues for a given structure, maybe those would correlate to thermostability and things you see in those organisms. Um, so that's a, an MSA of natural sequences going in there. 
Ah, so so sorry, during training, yes. So during training, okay. we say, so we say, okay, so, so the training goes, you give structure, you predict these site-wise and pairwise constraints, but then what you do is you check to see that all these sequences that are associated with the structure um, score really well. But then during the design procedure, we don't actually have those sequences anymore. So now during the design procedure, the only thing that goes to this model is our structure. Um, and then what we could do is we could say, okay, we have now the site-wise and pairwise constraints. How well does our sequence match these site-wise and pairwise constraints? Um, and so now we're optimizing the sequence to match these predicted site-wise and pairwise constraints. Um, and at the same time, we're also trying to make sure that our original model uh, is also predicting that this the sequence folds up into that same desired target structure. Um, so in some ways, we're, we're optimizing both ways, the probability of structure given sequence and the probability of sequence given structure. Um, but the way this model was originally trained was trying to optimize or maximize the probability of all the associated sequences for a given structure. Okay, I, I think there was a few other questions here. I wanted to ask if this pipeline is faster than if these sequences were just made through direct design using Rosetta. Uh, um, oh, that, that's an interesting question. Yes, yeah, so it, it is definitely faster. Um, so the reason why it's it's faster is because if we go back to this final conclusion slide, um, what we think this model, like this TR Rosetta model, it's effectively approximating the entire uh, folding forward, forward folding trajectory. Um, so if we go back to sort of maybe, maybe the introductory slide, I think maybe I should have spent a little more time on that. Um, so, so the idea is, um, so, so, so this, right, this model right here is what effectively what Rosetta is, where you have a structure and you keep changing the sequence and you try to optimize that sequence to match that structure. And so the problem here is that you're optimizing that sequence and it eventually will hit some target, um, but there's a chance that it might actually fold into something completely different. So the only way to check that it doesn't fold into this completely different uh, place or confirmation is to do effectively a folding simulation. You try out a whole bunch of different confirmations and you make sure that your confirmation has the best energy and all the other confirmations don't. In this procedure of checking to make sure it doesn't fall into anything else, it's actually quite expensive. You literally have like 10,000 computers running for days. Um, and so, and what effectively you're doing is you want, you want to check for this scenario here. You want to make sure that the probability of your structure is as, as high as possible given that sequence. And so what we're claiming here is that by combining these two, so this right here would be like forward folding and this right here would be like Rosetta fixed backbone design. So by, by combining these two, we're optimizing it both in those, in those two regimes. So making it much, much faster. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so my question was in regards to your training, you mentioned if you can put up the slide on your training that after putting in the site specific and uh, information using the conservation, uh, mm -hmm. conservation and coevolution, then you put in associated sequences. I, I just wanted to know like what these associated sequences are, and how many, uh, how many, uh, uh, like uh, how many such backbone structures with several sequences did you get to to start training? Yeah, so good question. So this is the exact same data set as the TR Rosetta. So the, the training said exactly the same thing. Um, so we have a multiple sequence alignment associated with every single structure. And so all we're doing is we're saying, okay, for every given structure, uh, we want to make sure that the model likes all those sequences that are in the multiple sequence alignment. Um, so, so the, I mean, that effectively sort of increases the amount of data that you have, because I think Traditionally, things like this, where people would usually train a single sequence for a given structure. Here, we're not saying, hey, given a structure, give me the sequence. What we're saying, given a structure, give me the site-wise and pairwise constraints. Um, and then all the sequences that we know fold into that structure based on homology search, um, we wanna make sure we wanna maximize the probability of all those guys. Um, and, I mean, this is literally, I think I, I, wrote, I kind of wrote it out here, uh, where you have a model that returns a, a W, which is the pairwise term, and a B, which is the bias term. And what we want to do is we, we have a predicted sequences based on this very simple uh, formulation here. And then we're just mi minimizing the, the cross entropy between these two guys, the, the original sequence and the predicted sequences. I see. It, but just to make sure, so these associated sequences do fold to the same structure, and we do have the crystal structure 
Expert. So uh, unfortunately, we only have one structure for all those sequences. Um, and uh, one other thing I, I did not include in the slide, but another thing that we added was we said, well, for every single sequence, we know the sequence identity to the query sequence. So that was another feature that we added to the model. So the model knew like, okay, the sequence is 20% within the query, or it's, let's say, 90% within the query. Um, and so the assumption there is that the model would have been smart enough to to know that, okay, this is a really distant sequence. So maybe the constraints hallucinated should be um, more relaxed. And this is a close sequence so then maybe the constraint should match perfectly. So I, so I told you about this, this method TR Rosetta, uh, but there are actually a lot of new methods coming out like alpha fold and Rosetta fold. And the question is, do they also exhibit a similar property that I just described to you about TR Rosetta? Um, there was recently a, um, uh, a perspective bullet written by Mink Young and, and David Baker. Uh, I forgot to include the citation here, but this is the figure from that. Um, and so what they found was methods like TR Rosetta actually are also very, very good at predicting the, um, so this is, oh, sorry, X axis is RMSD and Y axis is the uh, density. So these are the design proteins and the natural proteins. And so for a single sequence, it's actually really, really good at predicting the structure. Um, and also this, every dot here is another um, de novo design protein. And we could see that these methods like TR Rosetta actually does much, much better at being able to predict these structures. So the new class of models um, are, are showing the same, I guess you could say property where they're able to predict the structure of de novo design proteins and are able to do it much, much better than the original, the original TR Rosetta method, uh, which is really exciting because maybe that could um, solve that problem that I described to you guys earlier about that maybe the resolution is really low. So the idea is like, if you have a model that has higher resolution per se, then maybe it will also increase sequence recovery and things like that. Um, and so, so that, that, that's the, the excitement of that. Um, but before I go on and describe more things, I want to give uh, Yu, Yu Wang uh, to, uh, so, some time to sort of describe some of the stuff that we, he's been doing um, with these new model, models. So, um, hi everyone. Uh... Yeah, Sergey, Sergey invited me to add a few slides to this talk um, on the work that I've been doing um, with him and a few other people that's uh, pretty related to what um, Sergey just talked about. So um, you saw Sergey use this iterative optimizing of a sequence so that its predicted structure by one of these neural networks would would satisfy, would be as similar as possible to some predetermined structure. But you might imagine that you can set any kind of objective on the predicted structure. And so um, we um, took advantage of this to try and um, use this method for kind of a more general class of design problems than just fixed backbone sequence design. So that's why it's called partial hallucination. So um, part, of, part of the protein will be fixed background design, but other parts will not be. Um, and the biological problem is trying to design proteins that will scaffold some functional motif. So here, this orange bit maybe is a binding interface to another protein. It's embedded in perhaps a natural protein that has some inconvenient features, and you'd like to make a better, more stable, smaller, whatever, de novo protein that will hold this. So this is a classic problem. Uh, a lot of methods already deal with this, but we want to use this idea of the deep learning uh, structure prediction to try and address this problem. So um, I, along with a couple of other um, joint lead authors, put out a preprint on this so you can take a look at it. Um, the code for this is also out, so I'll actually like, walk you through a little bit of this. It's not on CoLab, unfortunately. Um, eventually, we'll get there, but this is sort of our first, you know, first iteration of this code and preprint it. Once it's published, we'll have um, even better tools for everyone to use it. So if you're not using deep learning, this problem has already been addressed by a lot of people. Um, you could take the motif of interest and put it into some natural protein. Um, this generally doesn't work that well, um, partly because it's hard to find natural proteins that will hold your motif. So if it's you know anything more complicated than just a little helix, usually it's quite hard. Um, the, there's a sort of a slightly more flexible general class of methods that um, try to make a de novo scaffold for your motif of interest. Um, 
by building up a bunch of fragments uh, that it collects from natural proteins. Um, this can work on a wide variety of problems, but um, it tends to also still be limited to relatively simple motifs. And you also need to specify the topology and general fold you want to get out of the scaffold beforehand. So um, it seemed like there would we would have a, a much more general way of doing this um, once um, some of these new ideas came out around hallucination. And so in particular, this paper, which kind of is a companion to the work that Sergey introduced earlier, where um, Ivan Anashenko took TR Rosetta, optimized it, started with a random amino acid sequence, and then iteratively optimized it until the predicted distance distributions were as sharp as possible. So you start with some Thing that's a little blurry and you don't tell the network what particular distance map you want you just tell it you want something that it feels confident about and you end up with folds that look very much like natural proteins and it turns out these fold in the wet lab and there's crystal structures you can take a look at the paper that Yvonne and Sam Pollock published on this so this we call kind of hallucination or free hallucination. Um, earlier, you saw fixed backbone sequence design. So let's combine the two to have a motif scaffolding method. So this is partially constrained hallucination, where you have a region of your protein, or here I drew some squares on a contact map. So there's some region where you want it to look like some input motif, but then there are other parts outside of these colored squares where you want it to just be confident about its prediction and you don't care what the fold should be. Um, and so this is diagram showing, you know, in the regions we use a cross entropy loss outside of it, we just minimize the entropy of the predicted pairwise geometry distributions. And we're using Rosetta fold which is more accurate than TR Rosetta, it also gives XYZ coordinates, not just the pairwise transforms. And so you can directly apply an RMSD uh, loss as well. So in practice, we use kind of a combination of all of these different losses to create scaffolds for certain pre-specified motifs. So the advantages of this is it's convenient. You don't have to decide what fold you want ahead of time. And in theory, it'll choose the best fold for the problem. Uh, I'm clear if this is actually true in practice, but it certainly is convenient. Um, and so, you know, in order to run it to get some kind of result, um, it's relatively easy, not a lot of setup or decisions to make. Um, here's an example. So we've now applied it to a bunch of different problems. Um, uh, we've mostly shown in silico results in our preprint so far, but we actually have a bunch of experiments now uh, in the burner. And so I'll share this one. Um, and there will probably be uh, quite a few more in our final publication. Um, so this is a kind of a classic binder design problem, binder scaffolding problem. So there is a helix uh, from the P53 oncogene that binds to its target MDM2, shown in blue. That's, this is just the native structure I'm showing. So if you use this method I just described, um, you can get all different kinds of things. Here's one example in gray with the purple showing where it's recapitulating the natural motif. Um, and then in addition to the hallucination we get out of Rosetta fold, you can just take the sequence and re-predict its structure by alpha fold, which is a sort of independent test of whether the sequence will fold up into the desired structure. And it looks a little bit different, but it's roughly the same fold. Um, and then here's just an overlay of the uh, of the binding interface motif uh, where you can see the side chains are recapitulated pretty well. And so um, I generated a bunch of these, filtered them down, chose a few to try and test in the wet lab, and we find some binders. So here, here's this is a yeast display experiment where um, we take like a pool of cells, shoot them through a flow cytometer to look at what color they are. Um, X axis is how much of the design we're testing is, is expressed and shown on the surface of the yeast. The y axis is how much it's sticking to the target that we want it to stick to. And so the positive control, there's a bunch of stuff in the top right hand corner, which means there's binding signal. If you don't add the binding target, there's no binding signal. And then on the right is a mixture of our designs from the hallucination method, the partial hallucination method. And you can see there's some binders in there. Um, we're currently kind of following this up a little more, purifying the 
grinder candidates and whatever. Um, somebody asked a question about like, you know, solubility expression success rates. So this particular problem, the expression success rate is like 50%. Um, monomeric success rate is probably a little bit lower than that, but not too much lower between a quarter to half of the designs um, are expressed in monomeric. So um, I'm going to pivot to showing you some of the code and how this all works, because um, this is all public, or at least the first version of this is all public, and you can go play with it yourself if you want. But first, I just want to describe a few more details about what is being done when I make this experiment. So, um, so this is a binder design problem. So the first thing I do is I just scaffold the motif. So I'm just calling this monomer hallucination. So if you have a binder, like in gray, it has a target, which is shown in blue. And there's a couple of specific parts of the proteins that we need to think about. So there's the motif that we're taking from the natural protein. And then there's some interactions between the two chains. Um, and so in the first step, I just make a bunch of hallucinated monomers that contain this motif. Um, there's various loss terms that I include in this step. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can ask me about it. Um, I actually do a second step using some of the results from the first step, where I'm modeling both the hallucinated monomer as well as the binding target. So the binding target, it's a natural protein. So we input its sequence concatenated to the um, hallucination sequence, and we don't allow that binding target to change in sequence, but its structure is being predicted in complex with the hallucination. So this allows the method to see, you know, chemical interactions between the hallucination and the intended target. And then there are some losses I include here. A lot of these we've kind of figured out through like trial and error and experimental rounds of iteration. Like uh, there, sometimes you get surface hydrophobics that don't get excluded enough without having an explicit loss against it. And charge also seems to be important. These are things that play into the success rate of purification and expression and stuff. Um, this can be iterated. Usually we do this to enrich for good designs and diversify them. And then um, in, in theory, you actually could at this point take the backbones and then redesign the sequence. So in effect, making the hallucination process just a backbone design uh, method. Um, and this actually, I would say, probably gives the best results. This is kind of analogous to the whole TRMRF thing. You're, trying to, you're putting in a prior on the sequence, um, or like you're controlling for the probability of the sequence condition on the structure in addition to the other way around, which is mostly what you're doing in the first step. Um, but it's actually not necessary. So if we skip independent methods of sequence design, this already gives sequences that will have the desired activity. I just They might not be as high of a success rate in terms of the expression. Um, so we filter them down by various metrics and then try them in the wet lab. And so um, to give you a idea of how this is all being done in the code. Um, you can take a look at our, let's see, there's a GitHub repo. So it's in Rosetta Commons, RF design. Um, the link is also on the slides. Uh, and so this, you know, there's a readme, shows you how to install it. There's a YAML file for the condo environment. Um, and then, yeah, some just like logistical information there. So the actual stuff, um, one, probably the most useful and important part, there's a Jupyter notebook that just goes through this binder design pipeline I just described. Um, so there's a lot of comments on what it's doing, and then there's code. This generates some commands that run the hallucination script. And so you can specify things, you know, like the PDB that you want to take your motif out of, the sort of the, core, the residue numbers of the PDB, how to put the constrained regions into the hallucinated protein. Like you have to decide on the lengths of the hallucinated regions. Um, and then some, you can keep amino acids the same as in the native. Uh, and then um, here's an, some, there's some code for like looking at the results and evaluating them and filtering them. Um, and then this is uh, the second stage where you're doing the hallucination in the context of the receptor. Um, and so this is all in the repo. Um, and then, so that was the Jupyter notebook in the tutorials folder, but then hallucination 
there's a script for this. And so there's all the code is here. You can take a look at it if you want. There's a lot of command line arguments. Um, uh, yeah. And so we're, this is very much a work in progress. Um, let us know if you try it and have some trouble. Probably will just because of how these things go. But um, I'm happy to answer questions by email. And then eventually we'll release a sort of an updated version of this that will probably be more powerful and have have a more polished code base. Yeah, so um, quick, any questions? Quick question for you yeah. looking at this repo. I've heard the words both in painting and hallucination myth mentioned in regards yeah. to this. What's the distinction between the two? Right. So um, let me talk about that really quickly. So um, they are two different methods for doing motif scaffolding. And I just told you about hallucination just now, did not say anything about in painting. Um, so here's a figure from our preprint. Um, the hallucination I just described is this cartoon in B. So um, sequence gets predicted to structure, uh, some loss gets applied to it, you iterate, update the sequence, eventually you get some design out. So in painting is a method that's also in the preprint, um, but it's totally different where we take Rosetta Fold and we actually retrain it on a different task than just structure prediction. So this is based on the observation that Rosetta Fold and also Alpha Fold, they have both sequence and structure inputs and outputs. So normally you think of these as they map a sequence to a structure, but they take homology template for mod homology modeling as, so that's basically a structure input. And then they have this, uh, protein language modeling loss. So you mask certain amino acids and then re-predict them in the MSA. That's kind of there for a technical purpose, but it's essentially a sequence output. And so because it has both sequence and structure inputs and outputs, you can kind of play games with what you want to map to what. And so what we did was we decided to just remove parts of the sequence, replace it with a mask token, remove part of the structure, replace the XYZ coordinates with um, zero essentially. Um, or the embedding of the XYZ coordinates with zero, and then apply a loss during training that asks the network to recover the structure that we removed and the sequence that we removed. And if you set this up the right way, you can end up with a neural network that's basically like autocomplete, but for proteins. So, you know, you're on your iPhone and you're typing a text message and it'll tell you like what the next word or few words should be. So this is sort of like you give it a protein, remove some part of it, and it'll tell you what sequence or structure should be in that part that you removed. Um, and this, so this is way faster than hallucination. Um, for technical reasons, it's not quite as mature, so it requires a little more finagling to get it to do the right thing. Um, but that's actually part of the GitHub repo, so you could run that too on sort of similar problems as hallucination. Do you have a feeling on which works better for what tasks? Right now, hallucination works better when there's a lot of the protein that needs to be built. Uh, in painting is much better when you already have a structure you like and you want to maybe diversify a loop or like regenerate a helix or something. So yeah, it, so it's sort of like they work on inverse problems. Cool. But ultimately we hope that something like in painting will become powerful enough to do the problems that hallucination does because it's way faster. Yeah, definitely. Um, I see a few hands. Uh, Sebastian. Yeah, oh. great talk. So um, I wanted to ask a little bit about like the topology. You, so you mentioned actually, I think it was Topo Builder, how that normally involves specifying the like secondary structure topology. And I, I realize that you're not doing that here. Yeah. But with the discontinuous functional motifs, you have like choices as to like how they should be wired together. Yeah. And also like you mentioned like the lengths. And I know that those are sort of like parameters that I think you can set when doing this, but I'm just kind of curious if you have a sense of how those like influence what you get. And if you guys have kind of explored those. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um... So often, yeah, so we, in some ways, we've replaced certain decisions you need to make using other methods with different decisions that you need to make when using this method. One of them is the placement and intervening 
region sizes of the mo discontinuous segments of a motif, if you, if you have a discontinuous one. And if it's a continuous single segment motif, you still have to decide what goes before it and what goes after. So um, those parameters do, do affect the quality of the results. We don't have any kind of systematic understanding of, of that. Uh, what we do in practice, it's very empirical. We, we sort of, we choose a certain size that we think is good, like something under 100 amino acids. We have a mode of the script where it just randomly puts all the discontinuous segments in. That usually generates a high proportion of bad designs. Um, we sometimes have some guess as to how they should be wired and what the lengths should be. And you can enter a length range so um, that it doesn't, you know, it can have some diversity. And then ultimately we run like a pilot round and then look at what wirings and topologies led to good results. And we kind of focus on those for subsequent rounds. Um, in our preprint, we describe some algorithms that we, um, developed, uh, some of the other authors developed the algorithms to use the loss, use kind of these like entropy and cross entropies to um, automatically choose the placement of the discontinuous segments. That's not in this code base. It was in our TR Rosetta version of this, which is also public. Um, yeah, but it's not part of the uh, Rosetta fold code. Um, the automatic algorithms didn't work super well with TR Rosetta. They like didn't work much better than just choosing randomly and then kind of focusing in, but um, they might be worth revisiting. We just, yeah, nobody has had bandwidth to try them. Yeah, so in theory, you could get it to maybe automatically choose the best topology. Yeah, that's not, um, hasn't been a focus so far. Well, thank you. Uh, Jared? Hey, awesome talk. Um, so I just had a couple questions. Is there any, um, requirements for how many discontinuous motifs you can have or how many residues that you can have in your motif? Um, does the you know time for inference to, to, to do this go up the, the more discontinuous motifs that you have? And do you see you know good accuracy even with a few discontinuous motifs or does it really depend on you know your your design constraints? Yeah. Um, so as you might expect uh, it performs less well when there are more discontinuous segments. Um, two is fine. Uh, three is starting to get challenging. And I think above three, it's quite difficult without having some preconceived ideas about how they should be wired. Um, we, I mean, as I said, we kind of just try sampling until we find a region of the uh, topology space that works or like the, the gap length space that works. Um, this is pretty wasteful in a way. Um, I, I think there's the, our current method requires a lot of trajectories to be run and then sort of rounds of iterative honing in on good um, design parameters. Um, I think doing things like the automatic uh, motif placement will help make this more efficient. Yeah, but that hasn't been a thing yet. Awesome. And the, does it just take longer or does the, just the results oh. look bad? Um, it, each trajectory doesn't take longer, um, but it, kind of for the trivial reason that trajectories are run for a defined number of steps. Um, but you'll have to run more trajectories to get out a, a given number of acceptable results. So the total KPU time is, is more. Awesome. And it's just that more proteins fail your filters. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, um, yeah, feel free to ask me questions offline, but I'll let Sergey get back to some of the other cool stuff he's got planned. Okay. Let me share my screen again. All right. So, so back to um, Alpha Fold. Um, so, um, we, we know Alpha Fold came out, and as I mentioned a little earlier, we know Alpha Fold and Rosetta Fold are actually much, much better at predicting de novo design proteins than TR Rosetta. So it naturally makes us think that maybe we could use this to actually maybe increase our success rate in protein design. Now, we haven't done any experimental testing to see if it actually will lead to more uh, better designs or not, but but the general idea is like the exact same way that you can invert TR Rosetta, you can also invert Alpha Fold. And, and exact same protocols and so on. 
Um, uh, but there is one problem with TR Rosetta, uh, sorry, AlphaFold, and uh, it's it's not really a problem for uh, for prediction, but it's a problem potentially for design. And that is the the model itself uh, has quite a lot of components involved here. So you have sequence, you have multiple sequence alignment, you have templates. So these are structures that are predicted to be similar to your sequence as input. Uh, and then you make some initial guess of the coordinates and then you refine these coordinates. Um, this is slightly incorrect because it turns out they initialize everything at zero, zero, zero. And then the structure module builds up the structure from that. But the part that's actually most important for us is the, this part here is not differentiable. So there's this recycling. So you can feed in the, the structure prediction back into the model and say, give it another go. And you just keep cycling this over and over and over. And it turns out that this step right here is not differentiable. Um, and, but during training, the way it was possible to differentiate through it is to not to differentiate through it. The idea would be that you just keep sampling. Like one time you might use one recycle, one time you might use two recycles or three recycles. But whenever you update the parameters of your model, you're only updating them based on the very last recycle that you run. So, but you never really backprop through all the recycles. And so this was a little bit um, uh, challenging to say, well, how do we actually design proteins if we can't really like, let's say if you actually require like three or four recycles, how do you actually go through the model and update your input sequence if you can't actually backpropagate all the way to the sequence? Um, and so, so for the first test was done like, well, do we really need that many recycles and maybe we can get away with less um, and so one test we did was we took all, all the de novo design proteins, this is from Baker Lab and other Rosetta Labs, and asked the question, like, how many recycles do you really need to predict those structures accurately? Uh, and so what I'm showing here is different number of recycles. This is like how many times you feed through the model uh, versus TM score. Uh, 0.5 means you got the right fold. Uh, anything below 0.5, you, you pretty much failed. Um, and so what we found was that you needed at least one recycle um, to get the right structure. Um, and this, of course, was a little sad. And, and so for a longest time, I was thinking about how to get around this problem. And so I'll show you guys the notebook and it looks a little ugly because I was trying out like 10 different ways of backpropping through the recycling. But one thing that happened was uh, there's a, this undergrad in my lab, uh, James Rooney, and he's like, hey, why is AlphaFold so bad at recycle number zero? Like what's going on? Like wh why is it so bad? Because we know, for example, Rosetta Fold, or at least the original Rosetta Fold, even just with a single pass through the model is able to predict structures really, really well. Uh, and why is Rosetta, uh, sorry, why is AlphaFold so bad? And it turns out if you actually look at the source code, it turns out it's actually kind of a, maybe a bug, maybe not quite a bug, but it turns out if you set recycle number to equal zero, what happens in the code is that it, if, if your recycle is anything greater than zero, uh, there are previous parameters being defined, like a previous positions, previous MSA, previous pair features. But if this value is set to zero, this right here, this whole block of code is skipped and the previous is just set to nothing. And later on in the model itself, where you keep adding the pair activations, so you add pair activations based on uh, the previous positions, pair activations based on the previous MSA, pair activation based on the previous, um, I believe in this case, uh, pairs. It, so pretty much all these layers are being skipped uh, because this is set to nothing. Um, and so you might think, well, it doesn't really matter because you're just passing zeros. It shouldn't matter that you skip them, right? But it turns out all these layers, they all have biases associated with them. So even though you're passing zeros, something is still being added to the pair activations. So something's being added here, something's being added here. Um, and so the simple way was to say, well, what if we fix this bug by taking this um, pair features and just moving it outside of this block. So that way, regardless of whether or not you define how many recycles, it, it will still run that block. So it will still run this, this, this code here. Um, another way that James pointed out to me was another way to solve this problem potentially is to say, well, let's just tell the model to run at more than zero recycles, but then there's a for loop and then tell that for loop to stop at zero. So that way it still uh, runs this part of the block. Uh, and so once you fix this bug, either by moving this block in the code, or you just reconfigure the model, say, well, I'm actually configuring the model with one recycle, but then actually running it with zero recycles, you get a, a very large boost in accuracy for a single sequence de novo design. So this is uh, the original configuration of AlphaFold, and this is with our bug fix. Um, I, I think I mentioned this bug to one of the Apple full developers and they're like, well, technically it's not a bug because you're not supposed to touch the configuration in the first place. Uh, 
Um, but so, but still, I guess I'm calling it bug because technically the model, when it was trained, so when the model was actually trained, you would randomly uh, sample number of recycles. And so there were instances when the model was trained with zero recycles, sometimes you were trained with one recycle, but in all those scenarios, you always pass the beginning as zeros. And so the bias was always present. And so then when you model, when you run the model at inference time and you start to disable the recycles, if you go to recycle zero, you actually are not no longer operating the model correctly. You're not operating in the way that it was actually trained because it was actually trained with the zeros inputs. Uh, okay, so, so the exciting thing is that it made things better. And now the cool thing was that it turns out that at recycle zero, you're almost as good as recycle one. Um, in fact, almost all uh, de novo designed proteins uh, can actually be really accurate predicted with this zero recycles. There are still some targets that you can actually get a uh, get slight boost by doing one recycle, but it looks like you, you for de novo designed proteins, you can get away with zero recycles. Now, now, the reason why this is exciting is because first off, it makes the model four times faster because you don't have to run four times, but also two times faster if let's say we were previously using one recycle. So it turns out you for most Nova proteins, you can just get out with zero recycles. Um, okay, so, um, so so far this is how I was explaining uh, AlphaFold as a model to you guys. But it turns out there's a few other things that go and come out of the model that maybe are not too obvious to write right by just looking at the original figure. Okay, so besides just having a sequence input, template input, and returning coordinates, the model also returns some kind of confidence metric. So it returns a confidence metric for every position, but also returns a confidence metric for every pair of positions. And, and, there, and the pair positions is quite important, let's say if you want to optimize for protein-protein action or domain-domain reaction. Um, but the other thing that it returns is a distogram. And the reason why this is kind of useful is because um, distogram is the exact same thing we've been using for, for example, TR Rosetta. And so if we optimize on the distogram, then it's more comparable to that protocol. But other thing we found that it's actually much easier to optimize through distogram. And this actually just tends to um, get stuck in local minimas like that. It's not as, as a friendly optimization protocol. But when you minimize this, you, you end up minimizing this. So it's actually pretty well connected. Um, and the other thing that's quite important here is that you can input templates. And so the reason why templates are kind of useful is because um, let's say if you want to hallucinate a binder to a protein, you can uh, input the target sequence uh, or the template as the target sequence, for example. So that uh, avoids you having to deal with a lot of other extra features that you might need to put in. Okay, so now the question is, how do you actually optimize through AlphaFold? Um, so the, the procedure is very, very similar to uh, TR Rosetta. Um, and the reason why it's very, really similar is because what we're gonna do is we're just gonna be using the distogram, which is what effectively TR Rosetta is returning as, as the output as well. So the idea is you have a you have a random sequence, you pass it through the model, you have a distogram prediction. Let's say you have a desired structure, you compute a distogram for that, you figure out the loss, and then you compute a gradient through the model, and then you can take the gradient, apply it to the sequence, and you just keep looping it around. Um, one thing we found out pretty quickly is when you try the same procedure that we tried on TR Rosetta, it didn't work as well. Um, and so one thing we try to do is try to explore if there might be some other ways of trying to approximate this discrete optimization procedure. Because the idea is like optimizing these discrete values directly is not differentiable. So you somehow need to approximate this uh, update here. Uh, and so some ideas of what we tried was, uh, so this is the original TR Rosetta formulation saying, okay, what we could do is we could take the argmax of the logits, subtract the softmax of the logits, stop the gradient, and then add the softmax logits. So what this does is effectively, the model sees the discrete values. This is what the input is, but it, it backprops through the soft. And so if we, for example, try that with uh, the model alpha fold, we can see all the values are optimizing and the structure gets closer and closer. Um, and it actually sometimes works, as you can see in this animation here. Um, alternatively, you could say, well, let me just input soft logits, like just it's soft max of the logits. And so you can optimize effectively a soft sequence, which is like the probability at each position. Um, and that also works. Um, and eventually you get closer and closer and you get some probabilities at each position. The cool part here is even though you're not, you're giving it a soft sequence, it ends up converging to very much a, a hard sequence where you all have a single assignment of amino acid per position. Uh, finally, you could do be a little more crazy and say, you know what? During optimization, I'm going to add some random noise 
Uh, and the reason why the noise is kind of useful here is because what that does is what this noise does is effectively samples from the PSSM. But the idea is if if you add this random noise, what that will do is it will push the sequence to become one hot because you want to fix certain amino acids. So if we watch the animation here, uh, what you could do is initially when oh sorry maybe I should, I'll just make this full screen. A very beginning of simulations, what happens is that um, the sequence is completely random, and as you keep optimizing, optimizing, eventually some positions start getting fixed, fixed, fixed until it, it converges to some kind of one hot representation. So the idea is that the noise is constant, like this, the magnitude of the noise, and but the values get larger and larger until it settles onto a particular category. Um, and, and finally, this then this is the mo probably the most silly test. Say, well, why don't I just optimize the continuous values? Um, say, well, let me just allow the values to be negative, allow the values to be positive. You don't care. We're just going to put in this random uh, um, continuous values and see what happens. Um, and then you could quickly find a solution that gives you back the structure that you want. Um, and so before I get too carried away with the slides, I just wanted to show you guys that. Um, so, so I'll go through this notebook in more detail, but I just wanted to show you that in the model setup part of the script, um, I have the options to specify. So like when you say you specify the design you want to do, uh, the, this is what this is all doing. So the same softmax, softmax gumball, where you add noise or the logits. And then finally, during the design, you can specify if you want hardmax or not. Uh, but I'll get to that in a bit more detail. Uh, so this is the reason I'm showing these slides. And stuff. Um, okay, but now let's see which optimization procedure actually works the best. Uh, okay, so, so he here's what happens during optimization. So it turns out this, this uh, procedure that we originally de developed for TR Rosetta, it, it works sometimes, but sometimes it just got stuck. It never really reached anywhere. Um, and so this is part of the reason why I was beginning to go back and try to explore other approaches. Um, so if you use softmax, um, it actually found the solution quite quickly. Um, I mean, it's still a little bit jittery, but you find a solution around about 300 iterations. If you add noise, it, it also converges. And I'm guessing if you just keep running this, it'll, it'll and the, but the largest one is the one that's the best. So, but the one th thing I want you to pay attention to is RMSD here. So if you look at any of these examples, what you'll see is that the RMSD gets to maybe about one, but has a really hard time getting, it's about maybe two angstroms if you use this procedure, even in the best trajectory. Uh, but if you use logits, it actually gets down to less than one angstrom RMSD. Um, and so, so this is one of the reasons why I was thinking this method is a failure. First off, it gets stuck, but also even when it does converge, it usually gets, it converges around two angstrom RMSD for some topology, sometimes one angstrom, um, but not less than one angstrom RMSD. Uh, while this logic approach, which looks completely artificial because you're just feeding in some continuous vector, it, it quickly finds solution about like 0 0.5, 0.3 RMSD to the solution. Um, and, and so the, the question is, can we somehow combine these strategies? Like, can we, so one idea was like, can we actually start with this strategy, find the best solution, and then slowly one residue at a time, flip it to this solution and continue optimizing, optimizing it. So this is where this meme comes into play. So, so both is good. Uh, and so, so here, here, here is uh, animation showing that. So it turns out this approach worked the best. So the idea is, we start off by optimizing complete input continuous values. So these could be negative, they could be positive. There's no constraints. Like it just finds some random vector that gives you the structure that you want. Um, and then after it converges, um, then what you could do is you can then go in and then one residue at a time flip it to be categorical uh, distribution where now it, you're, you're stuck in the one hot. Um, and it turned out it actually works really well. So even when you flip the, all the bins over to one hot. So if you flip all of them at once, it just crashes. But if you flip them one at a time, it, uh, it actually, and then let a few steps optimization between each flip, um, you actually end up staying roughly in the same structure. And you can easily get to an RMSD of, of sub one angstrom. Um, and so, so we suggest this is sort of a, probably the best way to probably go about this. And it, it turns out it works really well across many, many different folds. Um, but one thing I wanted to show here, this is a slide that I put in extra, but now that I'm showing this, I thought maybe kind of fun to look at, um, is there's something kind of interesting about these logits. Um, so, so, this is, so this is two different targets, two different proteins. Um, and what I'm showing here on this plot is number of iterations versus sequence identity is a sequence recovery. Um, 
And on the x-axis is number of iterations and an RMSD. And this is the original protocol, just saying I'm going to optimize the one hot logits uh, the same way we did in TR Rosetta. And what we found is if you just keep running this for a long time, um, eventually it converges, but the, R, but the sequence recovery is pretty low, 15%. And the same thing for this other protein. Uh, you get the RMSD to about one, and the sequence identity stays around 15%. Um, but the thing that's actually kind of surprising, and I, I'm kind of confused why this works, if you just switch to logits, um, logits makes no sense because you're inputting some random continuous variable. Uh, but once you put in the random continuous variable, you could quickly drive the RMSD down to like 0.25. Um, and so that's not surprising. But the part that was surprising was that the sequence recovery went up to about 30%. Um, so even though it's a, by, by sequence recovery, what I mean is like, if I take this weird logits thing that it learned, and I just take the max at every single position, like I say, what is the largest value at every single position? And I say, okay, this is my sequence. What is the sequence recovery? And that goes up to 30. And so I tried it for these two examples. I've now tried a few more examples after that. And even though you're finding some weird adversarial pseudo sequence, the pseudo sequence has a much higher sequence identity. Um, now, if you start to flip these things, it's, it's the, the, the sequence recovery starts to drop again. Uh, and so, so there's something interesting about, so, so I'm, I'm beginning to suspect these logits are not completely random. There might actually be something to them. Like maybe they represent like some kind of a PSSM um, or, or some kind of probability distribution at each position. So they're not completely random. Um, but it was kind of interesting that you, draw, you drive the RMSD down and then you can get higher sequence recovery. Um, okay, so, so that, that's uh, one reason why I put logits as one of the inputs to the option because I think it's something worth exploring. Um, and, and then finally, it's just two more slides before I jump to the, the notebook. Um, I also tried to do that same uh, um, test where I say, okay, let, for a given fold, let me just generate a whole bunch of sequences with alpha fold. In this case, I generated about, uh, I think 2000 sequences. This is how much I was able to finish in two days. Um, and so then if we do this collusion analysis where we say, okay, which residue is covariant? And if you remember from my slide earlier, there was a lot of missing contacts with the TR design sequences, but the alpha fold design sequences have many more contacts associated with them. Um, and so this sort of suggests that maybe alpha fold is looking at a larger context when it's making the prediction for the structure. Um, and also suggesting that maybe the sequences make more sense because before the sequences didn't uh, were missing some contacts, at least they were not covariant in the TR Rosetta sequences, but in the AF design sequences, I guess you could call that method, uh, it, it recovers more of the contacts. I mean, there's still a few contacts that appear to be missing, but it's also possible some of those contacts, those positions are like completely conserved. And so that's why, so I need to still investigate what's going on here. I know it's not the case of TR design, like all, those, all the positions have high entropy, um, but with AF design, I haven't looked too carefully at that, but, but it sort of tells us that at least it's passing some of these tests that we developed for TR Rosetta um, protocol. All right, so now, oh, uh, and I guess just before I forget, um, there were, I mean, I'm not the only one that tried to backprop these models or design things with alpha fold and so on. So I wanted to point out that there are other people that have been doing a lot of cool work related to, to this. So if you wanna check out some other work, feel free. Um, so actually these papers number two and three are probably the most relevant for what I'm talking about today is where they actually design uh, with alpha fold, but both methods, they rely on MCMC optimization where you sort of make random changes to sequence and you run a forward pass and you just keep doing that over and over and over. Um, actually this paper does something slightly smarter because what they could do is they could look at the, the predicted confidences at each position and inform the MCMC protocol, which positions to mutate. So it's not so it's almost like using some kind of gradients, but not not quite directly. Um, but also, um, uh, I also wanted to shout out to the Terminator paper from Amy Keaton's group. I think this idea is actually relatively similar to the TRMRF thing that I talked about, um, and it's uh, but it's a little bit different because they're using these tertiary uh, these little terms instead of just pure um, pairwise features that you get from convolutions. But it might be interesting to later on compare and see if it's capturing similar things or not. Um, so, so do check out this other work. I'm, I'm not the only one doing this stuff. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and just in case you guys all forget, there's a new episode of the book of Baba Feet, but well, that's not really important. Um, and, but if you're interested in collaborating or maybe joining my group, feel free to reach out. We do have some funding to hire people. So 
Uh, just in case anybody needs to leave, I don't want it to make that announcement. Okay, so but now back to the tutorial. Um, so I'm guessing most of you guys are familiar with Google Colab. Uh, so Google, for those of you who are not, Google Colab is literally a free computer from Google you can use for 12 hours. Um, in this case, I have the Pro account, which lets me use it for 24 hours, but you can still run this in a free account and that's not a problem at all. Um, and so one thing is I put together uh, this tutorial here, but um, you can also view it here. But one thing I should mention, uh, the code that I'm about to show you guys, it's an active development. Um, and this whole idea of how do you optimize to these discrete values is still not a completely answered question. So if anybody like is playing with the code and figures out a better way to do it, please let me know. Uh, we would love to incorporate that into the notebook. So this is uh, a, a still an ongoing project and we're still trying to make it better and we're testing it at more and more examples. Um, but any, any updates that I put to the notebooks, I'll be uploading them here. So you can check out the TR design code here, which is running now, now runs on Google Colab and alpha full design which is here. And maybe in the future, once Ju gets this stuff running in Colab, we can include a TR design link here as well. I'm oh, sorry, uh, RF design, just to keep it consistent. Um, okay, so, um, so the way the notebook works is that you load it up, you install the software, and if you wanna see what's going on here, um, I have a special repository for what I'm calling AlphaFold Backprop. Um, there's quite a lot of work that I've done trying to make it possible to backprop through AlphaFold, even though at the end it turned out that it was probably not as important because you can still predict structures with just zero recycles. But I do have a special version of AlphaFold where I've re rewritten a lot of the functions to make them differentiable. Um, okay, so, so, so the first cell installs AlphaFold. Um, and, but in fact, if you keep recycles at zero, you might be able to just get away with running the, the standard Apple fold code. Um, and this is where things get a little scary. This is my class that does the design. Um, I won't go through the code line by line, but I just wanted to point out if, if you wanna see how things are running, you can check it out here. Um, and so some of the things that we found that was quite important to, to think about is, um, so it turns out if you, during training of the model, this parameter use remat was turned on to be true. Um, and what this does is it, it enables checkpointing. So by default, if you try to backprop through alpha fold, you'll run out of memory even with a sequence length of 10. Um, and so to get around that problem, what you have to do is you have to tell you have to turn on checkpointing. So that's a flag that um, Hustis uh, pointed out to me. Um, the other thing that uh, is kind of important is that only models one and two are trained with templates. Uh, and so what I do is if, if there are templates being used, in this case for binder design, I could specify, say, okay, use model one as the configuration file or use model three as a configuration file. Um, so that's the other thing. Um, the other thing that's actually kind of interesting is, turns out if you enable the model into is training mode, it's about two times faster. Uh, and I was able to, uh, figure out why that's true. It turns out the reason why that's true is when you're in training mode, like when you said is training to true, it actually disables a lot of the chunking in the code, which actually requires more memory, but it runs two times faster. So if you have a huge, I mean, GPU with lots of uh, uh, memory, you, you might be able to run your model two times faster um, for, for sequences. So that's another thing that uh, we set to be true. But then the idea is like we set it to true, but then we could set all the dropouts to zero if, for example, somebody wants to turn off the dropouts. Uh, so, so the reason I'm, I'm bringing all this up is because what we found is all these little things made the code faster and faster and faster, and which is what we want if we want to backprop through AlphaFold and then do many, many steps. We don't wanna wait like minutes, we wanna wait only milliseconds per optimization. Um, the other thing that made things faster was this uh, number of sequences. So it turns out that AlphaFold, you, it, it compiles it, assuming that you're gonna give it uh, uh, 512 sequences. But if you're just designing a sequence sequence, you can just tell off a fold, there's a single sequence and that will make it also much, much faster. So it, it, it's, um, so, so there's a lot of things that, that are kind of interesting here that might be useful for anybody else to try to design with Alpha Fold. Um, the rest of this code, I won't go through too because it's, it's all just uh, Python and it's not really important for the speed ups. It's more of a, more of a practical thing of, why I did what where. Uh, so I won't do that. Um, okay, so so the idea here is the so the first cell you run here. Let me just stop the current execution. I think I'm trying to design a binder for the 
or spike protein. So this is running in the background. So that's why I had to stop that job. Um, okay, so import libraries, import uh, run this design function to set it up. But this is where things get kind of interesting. Um, so one thing we found is that during training of the model, uh, the developers use dropouts. So this is just randomly setting different nodes to zero. And we found that that actually helped also during the design process. So if you, during the design, if you include dropouts, um, you quickly get um, moved away from the local minimus. If you don't use dropouts, it usually gets to certain RMSD and then you just kind of get stuck there. But with dropouts, it sort of wiggles around. And that's why in the optimization, you might've seen how crazy everything was looking. And the reason why everything was just moving like that, so actually, let me just go back to that slide. Um, so you might've seen in the animations that I showed, uh, notice how everything's just wiggling like this. And the reason why that's happening is because I have dropouts on. So, so you, you, the gradients are being shifted every single time. And so you're, you're moving around. Um, but we found when you do that, you actually end up finding a local, a, a closer to the local minima. Um, okay, so, so that's one part. Um, now, the other thing is, the question is like, should you use all five models? So for example, AlphaFull or DeepMind trained five different models. Um, and one idea is you could just run all of them in parallel and that actually is quite expensive to do that because now you have to run it five times longer. Um, if you actually have a giant GPU, I've actually configured the code to run all five models in parallel um, so that so you won't get any. Uh, so, so it definitely does better to average the gradients. But one thing that turns out to work almost as well is just a sample. So what happens in each iteration, we randomly pick a different model and use the gradient from that model. So, so this right here, so you have an option to either sample the models or run them in parallel, or alternatively say, you know what, I actually only care about using one model. And this is a little bit dangerous because you might overfit on that one model. So the sequence might overfit. And so the idea is you wanna find a sequence that all five models that AlphaFold or DeepMind trained will, will fit or be happy with. Um, and finally now deciding how many recycles you wanna use. Um, and so what we found was for de novo design proteins, zero recycles was enough for most proteins, but we found that for some uh, proteins like very complex topology, like beta barrels, uh, actually having up to 24 recycles is required to fold that protein. Um, and so uh, this is something you may need to increase for, let's say if you can't design a very complex topology, you may actually have to get away and use more. Uh, but if you do decide to use more than one recycle, there's a couple of options here to deal with that. Um, and so one option is to say, you know what, let's just add up all the lodges across all the recycles and just use those and just optimize that way. So it's not really back propping through all the recycles, but you're saying, let me just add all the logics at every single recycle into one. And we found this actually was the most stable, uh, but unfortunately, because now you're back propping through effectively five different models, you have, I'm oh, sorry, four or a number of models that you selected for, it will require that much amount of more memory. Um, alternatively, you can say, I'm just gonna take the gradients from the last recycle, um, and then there's here some experimental code of trying to backprop through all the models. Uh, but it turns out what actually worked the best was to do the exact same thing DeepMind during, did during training. And so at each iteration, you just randomly sample the number of recycles that you use. So sometimes you'd use zero recycles, sometimes you use one recycle, and you could set the max number of recycles to use. Uh, and so this, this is the recommended option. Um, but the reason I'm leaving the rest, of, the rest of these options here is because maybe for some other application, one of these other options might work better. So you guys could play around with that. Okay, so now for fixed backbone design. Um, so, so the way this was configured, and I'll just show the code here really quick, is um, one thing that happens is between design procedures is that memory just keeps accumulating. So I wrote a little function called clear memory and that just clears the GPU memory. Um, and then what you could do is you can initialize a new class, a new model design class using this make design model. And you could put in all the options. And these are the options that were configured up here. So all these options get synthesized into a dictionary and these get passed to the model. And then I could specify which protocol I wanna use. And so right now I have three protocols. In the notebook, the fixed backbone design protocol. So this is for a given structure, find a sequence. The hallucination protocol saying, well, just try to find a sequence that, uh, that is as, as confident as possible and makes as many contacts as possible. Um, and I don't care what it looks like or any or anything about it. And finally, the last one, I say, well, I, I have a structure that I, I that I want to design a binder for, I hallucinate a binder for. So these are three modes that are currently available. And so for the first part of the tour, I'm just going to use this fixed backbone. 
Um, and then finally, um, uh, there are these different modes of optimization that I talked about. Um, and so in this case, I'm going to set this to logits uh, because that's what we found to work the best. So here you could put in your PDB code and your chain ID, and all that does is downloads the PDB. Um, so the way this works is that you first initialize your model, um, and then you uh, run one of the functions prep inputs, uh, and then you can just write model design uh, and then design 100. So by default, this, this function design, um, it will automatically make all the values hard. So each position will have hard values. Um, and so in here, what I'm showing in this particular example is if you just run this for 100 iterations, and at each iteration, it, it randomly selects the model that it's using and then randomly selects the recycles that it's using. In this case, since I set the recycle to zero, it's always just using zero recycles. Um, and then it says how many values are turned on to be hard. So these are the discrete values. Uh, this is my loss function. This is sequence identity or sequence recovery. So how close you are to the original target that you're designed for. Um, these are a, a few different metrics. Uh, at PAE, this is the, for every pair of residues, the confidence and the PLDDT. Um, one thing I should warn here is that these values are a little bit different. They're scaled from zero to one and zero meaning that it's good and one means uh, um, bad. And so you're trying to make that as low as possible. Um, I think normally when people think about PLDT, you want to maximize that score. But in this case, we're trying to minimize that value. And so I flipped the direction. So the lower, the better. Uh, we have the dgram loss. We have the FAPE loss. We also have the RMSD. Um, and by default, all of these things are added together into a single loss function. Um, but you can specify, I have an option here that says weights. You can say, you know what? I want to give FAPE, I don't know, weight of two. And dgram, I say, or a weight of one or something like that. So, so you could play around with the weights, um, or you could just say, I'm going to just keep everything default. What does FAPE and dgram mean? Ah, good question. So, uh, so the the dgram is so th this is the distogram. So, from alpha fold, you get back two different things. What you get back uh, a predicted effectively distance matrix or a distogram. And then you get back coordinates, which is the X, Y, Z coordinates. Um, and so you could compute effectively a cross entropy function using dgram. Um, so maybe I should have called it CCE uh, of dgram or something like that. So, so that, that's what that is. So this effectively is the same thing as the TR Rosetta loss. Uh, now what the FAPE loss is, is a new loss that DeepMind developed. And this is the loss that actually is being used during the training procedure. So during the training, both of these losses are being optimized. And so what the FAPE loss is doing is it's, it's aligning every single residue at, at every single residue, like one, one residue, one residue, and then it's computing a distance to all the other residues. And then it's trying to uh, minimize that, that vector between every pair of residues. Um, so this is the, the FAPE loss that DeepMind used for, for optimization. And what, one thing we found was that this loss is actually much easier to optimize than this one. Um, but in, and I think if you look at my code right now, so if we go back to the distance function here, I think by default, uh, this might get a little ugly, but um, let's see. Um, so for the different design protocols, I, I have some set defaults here for the weights. Um, and so right now, all the weight is gone to dgram, and then I'm giving a little bit of confidence weight to say, hey, make everything as confident as possible. Um, and FAPE actually is not being used at all. Uh, but for other tasks like hallucination or binder, I have a slightly different version, different weights that I'm using for the different parameters. And this is something that I've been playing around with just for a few toy examples, and it's definitely not benchmark on a large set. So there's a possibility that you, for your project, you might find a different weight configuration will work better. Um, so you could either modify the code here directly, um, or alternatively, I made it as one of the uh, flags, or I guess you could say options that you can specify and tweak with that. Um, okay, so if you run this protocol, and so the way I set this up is if you run design, say 100, um, and by default, it will just return to you the steps whenever the loss gets lower. And if you actually want to print out everything as it's optimized, you can say print all equals true, and then it'll actually print out every single step. Like right now, just to make things a little less verbose, I just said, hey, just print only the lines where the loss actually decreases. So it does shake around a lot, but it only decreases. Um, and then let's say if you ran for 100 iterations, you're like, you know what, that's not enough. I want to run for more. You can just call this function again and specify, hey, I want to run for 200 more. It'll just continue running. 
So since the class will just keep running. Um, and so one thing in this particular optimization is all the values are hard. Uh, and so this by default, the protocol that's being used um, is this protocol here, where what I'm doing is I'm optimizing the, um, this uh, the, over this function and I'm dealing with these values. Um, and so what the, so what this n hard is saying is like how many positions in this protein are set to this hard value. Um, and so what you find is that if you look at these values really closely, you'll see that it, it actually stops around two angstrom arm is D um, and it doesn't get any lower. Um, and so one alternative idea is to say, let's just try and cheat and, and optimize the logits. And so what you could do is you can set hard to false. So all the values are now set. All the values are initially all set to logits. And you could see after just about 200 iterations, your RMSD drops to less than one. And then what you could do is then you can say, okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and switch hard back on. And then I say every single uh, iteration, I'm gonna switch one position to be hard. And so then you'll see these are all zeros. And then slowly I'm switching them back on, back on, back on. And you'll see even after I switched everything back on, RMSD remains at about one less than one angstrom RMSD. Um, and so if you wanna sort of see an animation of how that actually works. This is the same animation I showed in the slide, but what I'm doing is I'm op optimizing the logits and they makes absolutely no sense why that should work. Um, but then, but if you actually look at it, it's actually not too bad. What happens is you'll notice this, the max values are actually end up staying about the same. And so then I switch everything to be one hot at the end of the animation. Um, and what I found is for, for most tasks that this procedure worked the best, it's like you almost, you move the model to a happy space and you say, okay, now, switch to be one hot. And the reason why one hot is important is because if you keep it as logits, um, then the only way to get alpha fold to recapitulate a structure is to feed those logit back in. But if you now keep the sequence as is, um, and then you can pull out the sequence. And now if I throw the sequence and let's say if you have your own alpha fold running instance, it will actually predict that same exact structure. Um, and so I have a function here, design animate, as so you can get these animate animations. Um, this function also has some options here where you could specify, um, let's see. Oh yeah, so you can specify the start and end. So let's say if you wanna make an animation of let's say frame zero to 10 or from 10 to 20, you can specify the start and end. And also let's say if you want to, I don't know, make this into some kind of art project, you can make, you can increase the, the, the DPI to be much larger. So then you'll get a higher resolution animation. Um, the other function here is to get the sequence. So if you actually optimize the sequence, you will give it back to you. And finally, the function to plot the PDB. So then you can look at the PDB structure and see what the side chains are used. And so you see here, the cool thing is you see like hydrophobics inside, hydrophilics outside. So I think, but I mean, there's looks like there's some hydrophobics here. So maybe it's not the perfect design. Um, and finally, you can save the structure using this function here by running this. So, so one thing I should mention here is that it's also possible that it's designing an oligomer. Like it might actually, maybe there's like another copy of the protein that like binds here or something. So like, as far as the model knows, it, it, it's just optimizing the probabilities. It doesn't know. And so one thing that I don't include the notebook, but should be possible to add is add some kind of negative design. Say, hey, don't form an oligomer, form a monomer. And so that might be one way to in the future um, prevent it from putting like hydrophobics on the, on the surface and so on. So, so the code is meant more for you guys to experiment with, and it's not really uh, meant for production use yet. Um, it, it's just like, hey, what does AlphaFold think the, the sequence should be? But um, there's no guarantees it will work, and it's possible we might have to include more functions like negative design against oligomer states and so on to actually get it to work. Um, okay, so, so, that, so that's the, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that by default, it will run this procedure that's not very optimal, but you have the ability to do this, this switch in the middle. And that's something that we figured out recently actually worked quite well. It's like you, you cheat, you, you get the model into a happy space uh, and then you, you, then you start to deviate and you change the sequence and that actually works quite well. Um, okay, so another example, uh, so two more examples here. So another example is say, well, let's hallucinate something. Uh, and so the same thing here, we're clearing the memory, initializing a new model. Um, and it's still using the same options that I've defined up here. So if you wanna play around with these options, you'll have to rerun this cell here. 
Um, and if you scroll down, I can say, you know what, I'm going to hallucinate a model um, and I'm just going to run it for 50 iterations. Uh, and here, um, so, so there's one new loss that I added here, which I'm calling con for contact. Um, and so one thing we found is if you try to minimize PLDT, and that's like the only thing that you minimize, it will always just give you back one helix, like literally one straight helix. And if you minimize PAE, it will give you back a helix bond, like two helices, that's it. So if you only minimize predicted alignment error, you always get two helices. PLDT will only get one helix. Um, and it, it might be one of those gradient descent kind of things where the easiest way to get these scores to be as low as possible is to just make helices. And so one thing we added was say, you know what, At, try to make as many contacts as possible. So this is what this con score does. So it just says, make as many contacts as possible. And then when you do that, then you actually end up getting a structure that looks more like a, a protein. So in this case, I ran for 50 iterations. Um, oh, and by the way, the reason why this is all running around crazy back and forth is because I have dropouts on. And so that's why the fu function like fluctuates so much. Um, if you disable the dropouts, then it, it actually um, it gives you back a sort of more stable optimization, but then it gets stuck in local minimas. Um, so that's the sort of trade back. Uh, so, so in this case, what I did is I ran it for 50 iterations. I looked at the structures like, oh, it's going in the right direction. Then I ran it for another 100 and, and dropped that loss even further. And I could look at the structure again. Um, here, here I, don't, I don't run the two commands, but you could technically run the same command to get the sequence, the same command to get the animation, and so on. Uh, OK. And now for the final uh, example. Um, so um, I, I think on Twitter, I was like, hey, does anybody have any requests? And so I think one request was like, hey, can you design uh, a binder for a, a template structure? Um, and so, so here, so I, I set up the code to do that. Um, so it turns out that if you just feed in a template to AlphaFold, it will just almost, it, it, it will change the template a little bit, but it doesn't change it much. So if, if you want to sort of stick to one particular configuration, you can just feed in the template that you want to stick as a configuration. Uh, and so the same thing here, we, we clear the memory, we set up the model. Um, in this case, uh, just for demo purposes, I, I switched to sequence mode to softmax. So the idea is like, to train, like learn a soft sequence. Um, and I'm designing a binder of length 26. Uh, and so this is a protein I believe I picked from uh, one of uh, Amy Keaton's paper. Um, this is BCL2 protein. Just to show you what that looks like, I believe. Uh, yeah. So, so this is the protein here. Um, and the reason why, oops. Okay. Uh, so, so, I, so I picked this protein here and what I'm doing is I'm starting with the structure and then I'm asking the question like, can it, and so one, one way to sort of test like, is this even working at all? Is to ask the question like, will it re-hallucinate the original helix that was designed to bind to this protein. And so here I'm actually starting with completely zeros and I'm asking AlphaFold to re-hallucinate a new helix. And then I can ask the question like, does that helix re uh, appear in the same site? Um, so in this case, I'm, uh, so here you'll see there's a couple new things that pop up. So I have both a contact score that's within the, the binder and the contact score that's between the binder and the target. Um, and I found sometimes playing around with this ratio might help because if you just try to maximize the context between the binder and the target, it will just create one long helix and try to wrap around the target. Um, and But if you give the interest score a little bit higher weight, then it will try to fold that protein to a nice compact structure. So so playing with these weights might, might help in the future. Um, but in this case, it's just a helix, so it doesn't really matter too much. But these are something to, to keep track of. Um, and so here, minimize and loss. And so here you could see an animation. So for this example, the sequence is all zeros. And, I'm, and it starts off with just a softmax representation of the sequence. Here, I'm also plotting the PAE. So PAE are the predictive alignment error. So blue means good, red means bad. Uh, so so the, the lower the value, the better. Um, and so right now, the sequence, which is not really a sequence, it's just uh, nonsense, it's just all zeros. Uh, is is not even on, on the chart. It's like probably somewhere over here. Uh, and it's not predicted to be pre uh, interacting with this protein. And so now if I continue the optimization, eventually it, it hallucinates a helix. And you can see it's now converging to some kind of one-hot encoded sequence. Uh, 
And now the confidence of the interface is getting really, really good. Um, and it actually now uh, stops there. And so now if I just download this design, so here's the, the design, here's the sequence, and I just saved the PDB file, then loaded PyMol. And the part that's actually really cool is if you actually compare the design, actually, I don't remember which is des design and which is the, but, uh, but you can see that um, the helix that it hallucinated is actually, it's not exactly there, but it, it actually hallucinated in, in, the, in, this, in this roughly the same spot. Um, and part of the reason why it might not settle exactly in the same spot is maybe because of the dropouts. So, because each time you run the model, it, it, it jiggers things around. And so you could sort of see this helix is kind of vibrating back and forth. And I'm just picking one frame to show you guys. Um, so I think maybe one thing that might be fun to try would be have dropout on during at the beginning and then maybe turn it off for like the latter part of design. So then it stabilizes to some, some solution. Um, so this, this one, you can see it, it actually, the cool thing is that it found that same spot and then it, it just stuck there. Um, and I don't know if this sequence makes any sense, if it will actually bind or not, but uh, it seems to put some amino acids in there. Um, so I don't know, you guys could share it, tell me if you think it's garbage or not. But here, here is the, um, oh shoot, I think I, I think it might be printing out both the, the, the target and the design sequence. So, so this is a concatenated version of that sequence. Um, okay, and, and just, just to tell you that I'm not making things up here, I, I ran it for one more example. And this is another example from Amy Keaton's paper. Um, so this is another, protein where in this case, there's actually a helix inside the protein. So I thought this might be a more fun thing to try. Um, well, I mean, it's not exactly inside, but it's, it's going inside the cavity. And so same story here, I ran just for a hundred iterations. Um, and here, I think I was playing around with some weights, but I, these weights actually don't make a difference. So you could turn them off. Um, but yeah, so, so here you can see it's the, the helix starts off by like just like almost like, I don't know, doing some kind of helicopter at the thing at the very top. And then as you keep keep running it, eventually just like goes and inserts itself right inside where it's supposed to go, uh, which, which is kind of cool. So so one thing that I'm not really sure about is like, is this really protein design or are we like re or impeding the, the missing part of the protein? Um, I mean, I guess it's technically the same thing. It's like, but uh, it, it does make me wonder if somehow AlphaFold learned that there's something there that needs to go there. And maybe if anything, we're like, I, I don't know if this is actually a good sequence that it came up with or not, but but it, I guess it's a philosophical question there. Yes, Sergey, quick question for you. Yeah. Is that Helix that you're comparing to from a PDB that's in the training set or is it from something like, Keating has come up with with her um, in painting. Um, that or... I don't remember. I don't know if Amy's here or not, but um, it's it's one of the. Uh, so this is a protein that's in the PDB, um, and I don't remember. I think this might be a designed helix. Uh, I don't remember exactly now, um, but during the design procedure, I am uh, just trying to design a new short. A peptide or a helix, I guess you could say. And, and the question was like, will it put it in the same spot or not? Um, and so, but one thing I should mention that during the training, um, DeepMind only trained on single chain. So in this case, I'm using the single chain model. And I did that on purpose because I didn't want to bias towards known complexes. So this is using the single chain model. Um, and the part that was kind of interesting was that it, it just placed it right there where it's supposed to go. Um, and one thing that's a little bit scary though is, so one thing I also tried um, is I also tried designing something for the spike protein. Um, and this is the one that's kind of interesting because what what's happens in this one is that it, it also almost always places it where the ACE2 protein is. So it's possible that it learned that there's something implicitly there and then just filling in that spot somehow. Uh, let's see if I can make this last animation here. This is something that was just running while I was giving the talk because for, for, for the spike protein, it's a bit of a larger protein. Um, and so it, it takes a bit longer time to run. Oh, Sebastian, you have a question? Hey, yeah, so this is really, really cool. Um, I was just curious. So um, 
you, you kind of like pointed out that maybe it's sort of just like learning to fill in the structure that's like missing. Um, so like in that last structure, maybe that's like one example where that might be the case because I just don't really expect it that like receptor protein chain in isolation without the peptide to really have that structure. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I guess one of the like potential benefits of alpha fold is that it's able to model some of the conformational flexibility of these target proteins. So um, I know this is like super early in its stages or whatever, but like, have you considered kind of giving it like something that looks like an unbound like APO structure and seeing if that helps and maybe even that'll help prevent it from doing this sort of like going straight to this one binding site. Maybe you'll start finding like other interactions. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's, that's a good point question. Yeah, and in this case, I actually purposely selected this one uh, because I, the question that was on Twitter was somebody was asking like, hey, I, I, how do I force alpha fold to predict one particular configuration? And then how do I design for that particular configuration? Uh, and so the idea here was like, here's the structure that for whatever reason you want to force it to be in that configuration. Now I'm going to design a binder to sort of push into that configuration. Um, I mean, I guess maybe the way to do that would be to do some kind of negative design where you include maybe both configurations of the model, uh, sorry, template, uh, and then try to do some kind of negative design. Say don't bind to this one, but bind to this one, uh, which I don't have set up. Um, but, but yeah, but that's a good point. Like, let's say if, if, um, this case might be a little bit cheating because in this case, um, let's say if you didn't know that this is, it needs to be open to be bound, then if you hallucinate something, so, so maybe it's not necessarily the best example. Um, um, yeah, but I mean, also maybe it is possible that if you, like I know you're using a template and I guess what I don't understand and maybe you could answer this is just how much freedom the protein has to like move around given that there's a template. Um, but it seems possible that it could explore like ways to open up and allow the peptide to bind. So that actually seems pretty exciting. Yeah, so, so actually that, that's a good point. So one thing we noticed is that if you set recycles to zero, the template almost doesn't move at all. It's almost it just stays identical, uh, which could be a good thing, uh, but it could be a bad thing if let's, for example, if you're trying to model some motion. So I think one thing that should be possible to do is to say, if you set to recycles to one or two or three, uh, maybe the next recycle, it will actually like, I don't know, close on itself or something like that. Um, so that could be kind of fun to explore to see if that changes the configuration. Um, yeah, but yeah, lot, lots of play around here. And so my intent was just to give you guys the tools to experiment with, have no idea if it'll work or not. Uh, and if you guys find something cool, please share with me. Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and I guess this is the one attempt I had at, at designing a, a binder to the spike protein, but it looks like it's actually, um, looks like it's getting somewhere. So th this, this particular configuration didn't, didn't, uh, sorry, this, um, so, so I think the animations that I showed before I, I used like one recycle. So here I'm just, I was just testing with zero recycles just to see what happens. Um, and also I'm testing out with a, a soft max of the sequence instead of a discrete values. And so all, all those different changes gives you different solutions. I'm sure the seed also plays a role as well. Um, Okay, so I think I think that's all I had to show. Um, I think one last thing I forgot to mention, but I think might be useful for you guys. Um, so, so one thing that one issue with AlphaFold or the JAX code in particular is that it takes about five minutes just to compile a model. So you pretty much just wait for five minutes just doing nothing. Um, and but one cool thing is once you compile the model, you can just keep reusing that same model over and over. Uh, and so the reason why I added this little extra flag here restart is that you, let's say you run one design trajectory, instead of rerunning the code again, you can just hit restart and then it'll, it will clear the past gradient. So clear the past iterations in the sequence, it'll reinitialize, but it won't recompile the model. So it'll actually just start like, for example, let's say I just say restart and it will just continue running uh, a new, um, oh, in this case, I should probably say print all. So it prints everything. Um, and so it just continues running right away. Um, if you were to rerun this previous cell and then run this cell without hitting restart, then you would have wasted like five minutes just waiting for it to compile again. Um, so if you anticipate, so, so I think that's the only thing um, It's a little bit annoying with Jax is that every time you change the length of the protein, uh, you have to recompile the code. Um, but if you're not planning to change any dimensions and you just wanna run many, many iterations, um, you can just compile once and then just start a new 
cycle and hit restart equals true and it'll continue, it'll start a new run. Um, oh, one thing about these weights is that they're outside of the compiled model. And so you could technically like take like 10 steps, change these weights, take another 10 steps and you can just keep changing these weights on the fly uh, without having to recompile the model. So this is one thing that I, I purposely did that. So that way, so, so because one thing I was thinking, which I haven't tried yet is it might make more sense to first hallucinate some structure, make it as compact as possible, um, and then feed it in and continue optimizing it to be in contact um, or vice versa, try to optimize the binding first and then hallucinate the structure because it, it, because sometimes it, it, the gradients might push you in the direction that you don't, don't wanna go in. So it might make sense to have kind of a scheduler. Um, and so the way I set up the code is that you could technically run this and then you can remove this restart thing and say, you know what, now I'm gonna switch the PLD to T1. And then you can continue running for another 10, 100 steps and then you can keep running. And then you say, oh, oh I wanna set PAE now to zero um, and so on. Uh, one minor warning here is if you set, so these are all floats. If you make it into an integer, uh, the model will have to recompile. So just, so if you wanna set to zero, just make sure you put 0, 0. If you set it to zero, it's like, oh, I'm seeing something I've never seen before. I need to recompile this model. Um, so, so this is how you could continue. Uh, if you hit restart, it will restart from scratch. This will just continue running and it'll just keep accumulating. Uh, somebody posted something in the chat box. Is it possible to use this for a vegan interaction prediction? Um, so unfortunately there's no way to specify a ligand. Um, I mean, one potential, so if you look at that paper that Ju just presented a while back, so one way they sort of tricked the model into designing stuff for ligands is to say, well, if you look at a particular protein that binds to a ligand, often there's a, a very specific configuration of the side chains. Um, and so even though you don't see the, the ligand, you could still try to enforce the constraints to match those side chains. Um, so, so the idea is like, if you, if you know what kind of amino acids interact with what kind of ligand and how they're configured, you can set up the function for that. Um, so, so one thing I, I, didn't, I didn't show today, but um, we've also been using AlphaFold to design um, for a specific sidechain configuration. And um, if you look at the source code, um, I have some utility files here. Um, and this is something that might be useful even outside of our code um, is um, I added some functions to uh, compute RMSD, um, to compute PLDT, compute PAE. And this is mostly just calling literally AlphaFold's code to do that, but, um, oh, sorry, sorry. This is the RMSD, the dgram loss, the FAPE loss. Um, but one thing we found was that the, these things are kind of scattered throughout the code. And so we sort of pulled them in to utilities file. So if you just want to compute RMSD or FAPE, you can just specify and it will compute those things. Um, but on, one other thing we did was we said, well, what if you want to only do DGRAM at specific indices? Um, and what if you want to do FAPE at specific indices and at the site chain? So you could define it at the site chain level or at the backbone level. So let's say if you want, you want to hallucinate a protein to match specific site chains, you can do that. Um, and also this is something that's not part of the original AlphaFold code, but I also created a special RMSD function for the site chains. Um, and this, this function gets a little bit complicated because unfortunately some amino acids are a little bit ambiguous, like which atom should be aligned to which atom. And so what this does is it, it actually aligns based on the non-ambiguous atoms. And then it infers the, uh, the, the connections to the ambiguous ones and produce RMSD. So we did some logic here to to do that. So if, if you need that function somewhere. Um, and then finally, the other things that we changed um, is like, so what happens is um, there's a lot of things that go inside to AlphaFold. One of the inputs is the MSA, one is the target features. And so I, I made a function here that just replaces those features. Um, but the other thing here is it turns out that when you change the site, when you change the site chain, I mean, sorry, amino acid identity, you also need to change the site chain identity and so, uh, so there's a lot of conversion that happens here. Um, and one, I was trying to make that differentiable. So, so what happens is, let's say if you change the, the site chain, then um, you need to also update all the masks related to which atoms are being used. Um, and so before it was just a simple index lookup, which was not differentiable because the sequence never really changes during uh, 
uh, um, prediction. But for design, since the sequence is changing, we had to update that to make it differentiable. So, so that, that will make it pass through. Uh, this is kind of silly. This is just turning off the dropouts. Um, this is something I didn't talk about, but technically you could also design an MSA with this code. And, and if you want to color it in some funny way, you can choose your coloring scheme. Um, but so, so that's the other things that we uh, added to the code that might be useful for you guys. Great. Chris, I don't know if he's here anymore, but I'm sure he wants to design GPCR binders, some GLP-1 receptor helical mm -hmm. mimics. Yeah, so, so I mean, I guess if we were to time, so, so like right now the, the spike protein is, I think length of 200 or so. Um, let's see if we can find, okay. So the spike protein is about length of 200. And so let me just take one, I'll just run one iteration and just to time it how long it takes. Um, so one iteration takes, I mean, this is not the best way to time things, but I think it's a good approximation. It's about 10 seconds. Uh, so, and this is a total of, so 200 plus a binder length of 50. Um, so let's see, design model. Um, Target. Right, good. Okay. Okay, so it's 244 and it took 10 seconds to run. Um, so that's still manageable, but yeah, I think if you go to 500, it, it quickly is, I think it's, it's going to be like many minutes to run. Fortunately, I think it's like exponential in time run for time. Um, I guess just to do a test, let's just go, let's run this for 10 and then time that and then divide by 10 just to be more scientific here. Yeah, so, so this one, you see how uh, slow it runs. Um, I mean, it's 10, but it's still, it's 10 seconds per. So, I mean, this is like running a prediction, right? So you, each iteration is running a prediction. So, but hopefully you're taking like smart steps. And so it's gonna be a little faster than having to, um, now, if for a smaller protein, like like length of 50, it, it takes only like one second for inference. Um, so let me show you an example of that. So let me stop that for now. Um, so let's say I want to design, I don't know, a new, hallucinate a new protein. And I'll say I want a length, I don't know, 50. Let's just, let's just design a peptide of 50. Um, So the first time it runs, it's gonna it's gonna compile the model, um, and so this unfortunately, so the compiling step takes like three to five minutes. Um, but once it compiles, then we can do another timing. Okay, so it took uh, three minutes to compile the model. Uh, now, but once the model is compiled, let's see how long it takes to run. See how fast it runs. I wrote four seconds to run 10 iterations through the model. Um, and so let me just run that again for another 100 iterations. You can see it's, it's extremely fast. Like once you're like once you compiled, uh, then this is each step here is a different iteration through the help fold model. Um, and now the reason why the lot loss is jumping back and forth is because of the dropouts. Like First off, I'm sampling the model. So I'm using a different model at each iteration. Um, and I also have dropouts on. Um, if you disable those, then the, the loss just drops down continuously, not, not jumping around. So about 100 iterations in 40 seconds. So if you, if you want to design mini proteins, this is, this is like perfect. If you want to design like huge proteins here, probably you probably have to wait overnight for a design trajectory. Um, okay, let's see. I think there was another question here. Oh, okay, I think uh, I already answered that question. Um, all right, you guys. Well, I think um, if there's no more questions, 